بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله الذي أرسل رسوله بالهدى ودين الحق ليظهره على الدين كله وكفى بالله شهيدا وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له إقرارا به وتوحيدا وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله صلى الله عليه وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا أما بعد الحمد لله الله أكبر الله أكبر again here at the masjid um, last time I was here I believe it was a khutbah in the winter time Alhamdulillah, so um, it's good to be back with your brothers, Alhamdulillah. Um, however, as I was conversing with Brother Sabah earlier before the lesson, Brother Abu Khali, a masjid in this location is yani, it's necessary for the masjid to be utilized, for the masjid to be open, to be functioning. It has to be, yani, everybody's not going to come. Some people will walk in, some people will come, but it has to be a da'wah call. As Allah says in the Quran, Udru ila Sabidi Rabbik. Call to the way we Lord. Put Hadi Sabidi, Adru ila Allah. Say, O Muhammad, this is my path in which I call to Allah. The Prophet, alayhi salatu wasalam, he said, Call them. Falyakun awwal ma tadruhum ilayhi. The very first thing you should be, or the very first thing you should call them to be, should be kadal kadal. So in Islam, it has to be call. It's insufficient for the masjid to be open with a sign. Okay? It should, it should be events, it should be something where you're invited to come, you're requested to come, we want you to come. For the neighbors, for the people walking by, passing by. If we do this with sincerity, of the proper knowledge, you see the results and the fruits of that, inshallah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So that's a lot of bless all of you brothers here. Um, and to increase all of your beneficial knowledge and righteous action, inshallah. If you put that on the table, it's okay. If anyone wants to record it, inshallah. We want to speak about tonight, bidna Allah Azza wa Jalla, alayhi itikaf. We talk about alayhi itikaf, whereas it is a punish. Right. Last time that's Ramadan, the idea is like we're happy and we're sad at the same time. Happy that they are coming, opportunity, inshallah. Hopefully we reach there to Qadr. Hopefully we get to reap those benefits of the itikaf, of those last ten nights, especially the odd nights from them. But at the same time, as if we're sad, it's like Ramadan has. Came and it went, literally. SubhanAllah. Just like that, it's unbelievable. No, no. The Prophet وسلم, mentioned, yani, he says, He says, Time will become short, time will become close. And a different interpretation of the ulama with regards to what the hadith means. However, it states that time will become close by, closely knit. Weeks don't feel like weeks anymore. Months don't feel like months anymore. Khayran, inshallah. Ali Itikaf, the first thing we're going to speak about and we're going to read from tonight, we're going to explain and comment on the book called Sifat al Sami Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam Afi Ramadan. A description of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's fasting in Ramadan by Sheikh or yani, Sheikh Salim al Hilali and Ali Hassan al Halabi, who had a book in English has been translated for years, a description of the Prophet's fast in the line, and why it's circulation has been printed several times. This is the book in Arabic. So the two authors, the two sheikhs, they say, Hikmah to who? The Hikmah of Ali Atikaf. Why Atikaf? Qala al to Ibn al Qayyim. لما كان صلاح القلب واستقامته على طريق أو طريق سيدي الله تعالى متوقفا على جمعيته على الله ولم شعثه بإقباله بالكلية على الله تعالى فإن شعث القلب لا يلمه إلا الإقبال على الله تعالى وكان فضول الطعام والشراب وفضول مخالة الأنام وفضول الكلام وفضول المنام مما يزيده شعثا أو شعثا ويشتته في كل واد ويقطعه عن سيدي إلى الله أو يضعفه أو يعوقه ويوقفه أو يوقفه ابن القيم says due to the fact that a person's heart being steadfast being strong being healthy Due to the reality that the only way your heart is going to be healthy and steadfast is when it's totally devoted to Allah. When your heart is totally attached, 
connected and fastened to your Lord and is focused on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and there are many reasons behind a person becoming distracted from being connected with Allah, the heart. It says such as excess speech, excess sleep, excess mixing and dealing with the people. All of these things have an effect on your heart's focus on Allah. Due to the fact that this is a reality, Allah Azza wa He legislated the itikaf. In other words, the itikaf is only legislated for you to become a better Muslim. The itikaf, we only make the itikaf for you to be a more focused believer. Because the things that you leave off and avoid when you make the itikaf are all things that hinder your heart from focusing upon Allah. Ibn Qayyim says, all of these things here will split up a person's heart. Separate and chop his heart up into pieces, or it will weaken his heart. Too much mixing with the people distracts you from Allah's dhikr, no doubt. Excessive eating and drinking is not the sole focus you're going to be when you eat and drink. Being with your wife, a woman being with her husband, it's a means of distraction from Allah's dhikr. It's a means of weakening the heart and attaching the heart to other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Since that's the case, he's saying two things to you. The only happiness that you want to get. The only righteousness of the heart that you can experience is through being attached to Allah. Okay? And also things that weaken that attachment, food, drink, mixture with people. Since, that, since that's the reality, he says, بحيث ينتفع به العبد في دنيا وأخرى ولا يضره ولا يقطعه أو يقطعه على مصالح العاجلة والعاجلة. He says the the رحمة, the mercy of Allah, the exalted in might, the most merciful and kind, His mercy upon His slaves. The requirement of this mercy is that He legislated fasting for them. He gave them rules in which will allow them to remove that excessive food, that excess speech, that excess mixture with the people. He gave them a specific time of the year, a specific way of getting rid of all of that excess. And that, of course, is what? It's fasting, Ramadan. Too much food is harmful to you. Too much drinking is bad for you. Too much of you enjoying your pleasures, your sexual desires, is not always good for you. So therefore, Allah Azza wa as if He gave us a time out. Mm. A break for our bodies, our souls, and our spirits. Get right. But it's just a break. Because avoiding food in yani, totality will kill you. You'll die. Starvation. You need something to drink. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has put these things inside of the human being's body, sexual desire. You need to relieve that. To relieve, relieve yourself of that. You need those things need to leave your body. So not all the time, but sometimes. And this goes to show that Ramadan is based off of what? The rest of the religion is of a balance. The human being is a creature that needs to be around other human beings. He's a social animal. He has to be around people to talk, to help, even to fight. It's the nature of the human being. Some human beings are aggressive. You can't fight with yourself. Mm -hmm. Right, you? You can't fight with you. You need to beat up and fight with. That's the nature of the human being. So therefore, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he put these desires, these emotions, these feelings, okay, these natural dispositions in our bodies. So, to take them away from us totally, you can't do nothing, that's, that's harsh. But it's a specific time in which you need to break from that. You need to break from your brothers. You need to break from your children, from your wife. Your wife needs to break from you. You need to break from your belly. You need to be drinking and stuff in your face. You need to just relax. And this is from the wisdom of Ramadan. <laughs> I don't think in Allah that there is a sense of a person. They don't have to be Muslim, but someone has some type of sense and a sphere, except that they want to realize this hikmah. That's divine. It's a time in which you take a break from these things. What do the doctors say? Don't read too much. Don't read in the dark. Don't do this. Don't do that. Don't put a strain on your eyes. But I love to read. I benefit from reading. I learn from reading. Okay. But your eyes need a rest. Hmm. Your eyes need a break. Your feet need a break. Run, walk, do these things, but not all the time. You need a break. You practice, football practice. You do two, three laps. You go to the gym. You have a nutrition regimen. But now you need a balance, right, Malik? 
Yeah. And you say, Tay, you can eat a, a cheeseburger today. You need that balance in your body. Rest, relax. Don't kill yourself in the gym. But you do need to work out. You do need to train. But it has to come a time which the body rests and gets a break from that. And this is from the wisdom of fasting. Really. Not to torture you or to punish you. But to give your body a break from all of that extra stuff. And not only are those things extra, as we said, not only are they extra, but those things are means of distraction for one's heart. They distract you from being devoted to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But there's a balance. Islam is a balance. Okay? The Muslim is, should be the one who needs or should be around his brothers. The Muslim should be social. You have friends, you have brothers you like to hang out with, alhamdulillah. You have permissible fun you talk with, alhamdulillah. But at the same time, the Muslim also sometimes needs to salute himself. He needs time to sit in his grand by yourself. You need time to reflect by yourself. You need time to make think of the power of your sins by yourself. You need time to reevaluate yourself by yourself. So we say there's a balance. There's a balance. Okay? Look at any other example. Husband and wife. Husband and wife need to spend time with each other. Husband is to give his wife attention, make her feel special, be with her. But too much of that is going to cause a problem. She needs her own space. It's tonight she's went out with the sisters. There's a henna party. You go out with the brothers, I think you go out with the sisters. That's a healthy part of the relationship. But all of the time, every day, 24-7, you would grab and touch your wife. It may seem okay in the beginning, but you go on, you're going to say, I'm tired of you. Get out, get away. Because that's the balance in life. Everybody understand this? Yeah. Even with your children. You spend time with children, but your children need time with you need to play with other kids. In time which you need to be away from Abby and Umi and experience other things. Balance. So this is the hikmah of Ramadan and the hikmah of the antikaf. Is that it gives you a time to seclude yourself from the dunya. If we understand this speech, this golden speech of Ibn Qayyim, in Quran it only makes sense that we make it a to leave those things that you normally do off when you're making it together. Whether it's your cell phone, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, whatever is your electronic leash, you need to leave that alone. There's no need to catch you texting and calling and walking around and looking at the internet, sir. What's this? You might as well be home with your family. Okay, it's a calf. It's for you to pray, to read, to study, to cry, to make repentance. It's not wrong with answering a phone call if you have to an emergency or something like this. But it shouldn't be a thing in which your itikaf and your normal life is the same. Just like we said before about Ramadan. Your Ramadan Islam and the Islam outside of Ramadan should not be the same. It should not be the same. You should take it to the next level. If you're lacking in something, try not to lack in that in this month. It's not fronting or being fake or what lack. Try, strive. Comes with a step. Then the next final time. So this is the divine wisdom of the legislation of Ramadan in general, fasting of Ramadan. And the legislation of Ibn Taqaf. Ibn al Qayyim, he then says, Allah Azza wa Jalla, He legislates things for the slaves according to the benefit. Something that's not going to kill them, something that's going to help them in this life and in the next. It's going to help you in this life and in the next. He says, and something that suits your worldly and your spiritual needs and benefits. Fasting is a benefit for your body and your soul. Ibn Taqaf is a benefit for your body and your soul, for this life and in the next. And Ibn Qayyim even says, شَرَعَ عَلَهُمُ الْإِتِكَافِ الَّذِي مَقْصُودُهُ وَرُوحُهُ وَكُفْرُ الْقَلْبِ عَلَى اللَّهِ تَعَالَى وَجَمْعِيَتُهُ عَلَيْهِ وَالْخَلْوَةُ بِهِ وَالْإِنْقِطَاعُ عَنَ الْإِشْتِغَالِ بِالْخَلْقِ وَالْإِشْتِغَالُ بِهِ وَحْدَهُ سُبْحَانَهُ بِحَيْثُ يَسِيرُ ذِكْرُهُ وَحُبُّهُ وَالْإِقْبَالُ عَلَيْهِ فِي مَحَلِّ هُمُومِ الْقَلْبِ وَخَطَرَاتِهِ فَيَسْتَوْلِ عَلَيْهِ بَذْلُهَا وَيَسِيرُ الْهَمُّ كله به والخطرات كلها بذكره والتفكر في تحصيل مراضي وما يقرب منه فيصير أنس بالله بدلا من أنس بالخلق فبعده بذلك لأنسه به يوم الوحشة في القبور حين لا أنس له ولا ما يفرح به السوى فهذا المقصود لاعتكاف الأعظم ابن القيم يا الله عز وجل في قائم ساس since this is the case, what we've just mentioned, Allah made a rule, He laid down for the believers to perform itikaf. The main objective of itikaf, the greatest, highest goal of itikaf, is the stationary position of the heart. 
is for the heart to stay still, for the heart to remain in one place and devote itself to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And for one's heart to be secluded with its Lord and to do it with all other worldly things, all things of creation, your wife, your children, your husband, your family members, your friends, this person being traded to this team, this person being going to Canada, he scored this lab. The heart is always moving, bouncing back and forth. Now in the age of cash, the heart has to stay still. Relax. The heart needs to relax. And be focused on its Lord, subhanahu wa ta'ala. Ibn Qayyim then says, in order for the slave to think, in order for all of the slave's thoughts to be about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and Allah to be the subject of all of his thoughts, to think about Allah during these 10 days, or these 3 days, or one day, however long you may to kaf, to always think about your Lord subhanahu wa ta'ala. And also, to ponder over the things that Allah is pleased with. How to become better, a better slave, how to please Allah more, greater, faster, what is the best deeds to perform. Ibn Qayyim says, so therefore you find company in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala instead of finding company in the creation. Mm. And when you find company in Allah, as Allah, instead of his slaves, you will have that company when no one is with you, when you're by yourself, and that is in the grave. Mm. No matter how many friends you have, no matter how many followers you have on Facebook or Twitter or this and that, no matter how many teammates you have, Monique, when you go into that grave, that dark, damp, cold place, there's not going to be nobody in there with you. Not Nobody's going to make that smile you just made. That beautiful smile, mashallah. Huh? There's not going to be none of that. It's going to be you and your deeds. What you did. Your children mean nothing. Your parents, you and your deeds. But also, from the benefits of having righteous children, Mujahid, is that these are from the things, inshallah, that continue after you die. As the Prophet sallallahu said, when the son of Adam dies, all of his deeds cease except for three. And he mentioned the righteous child that prays for him. So all of the time that you spend on your son, all the money you spend on him, all the efforts that you put forth to make him happy to be a good Muslim, you're going to be repaid for it, inshallah. When you pass on, inshallah, he'll, you'll pray for him. You'll make dua for him. But other than that, you're going to be in the grave by yourself. You're going to be in the grave with no one, no one to come keep you company. So therefore, the reward, as they say, you reap what you saw. You felt comfortable with Allah in this life, and that's how you'll be in there after. And you felt it was, alhamdulillah, to be in the masjid, to pray, to read, to study, to be a good pious Muslim, you're going to get that reward thereafter. But if you always were bored, and you felt it, you know, totally not interested in so on and so forth, Islam, this and that, that's what's going to happen to you on that day, by the end of the day. So when Qayyim Ibn Al-Talim says, this is the greatest objective of Etikaf. Etikaf is not just meant to stay in the masjid, lock yourself in the masjid. It's not just meant to tend night to be able to call it. The greatest goal of it together is to cleanse your heart. To get rid of some of that soot on your heart, some of that film. Some of those scratches and scars and dents and holes, black spots. Scrub your heart. Your heart has to be clean to find comfort in the lost of God. If your heart is not clean, it's not going to find absolute comfort. Because the Prophet suddenly told us, in Allah Tayyibun, wa la yakbaru in the Allah is pure and fine, and He only accepts that which is pure and fine. So the sin or the hearts become, as Ibn Qayyim explained in another book, that a person's heart becomes rusty through two things. And a person polishes his heart through two things. The first way a person's heart becomes rusty is through disobedience. Sins. Acts of disobedience that you commit. Which means of your heart becoming stained and tarnished and rusty. And the second thing is ghafla, he said, is heedlessness. Even if you're not sinning, if you're not disobeying the law, but you're not thinking about the law, you're not making dhikr of the law, it's a means of your heart becoming hard. It's a means of your heart becoming tarnished, becoming worn out. And he said the two polishers, two things that polish one's heart, he says, is al istighfar seeking the law's forgiveness, and the second one is making dhikr of the law. Even if you didn't make any sin, you make alhamdulillah. This is another concept of Quran, and a very important concept as Muslims. You cannot go overboard. You seek Allah's forgiveness, and you also praise Allah, Allah, Allah. Alhamdulillah. Say it abundantly throughout the day. Alhamdulillah, Alhamdulillah. SubhanAllah, La ilaha illallah, the hawla wa la quwwata illa billah. SubhanAllah, wa bihamdi, SubhanAllah, al azim. And you also say, oh, Allah, forgive me. Stuff for Allah, stuff for Allah, stuff for Allah. Abundantly is a balance. You need both of the things to cleanse and to purify and to polish your heart. 
So therefore, that's the first step that we that we take, and that is is that irtikaf literally, or the main objective of irtikaf is what tricks are, but in your own words, what's the greatest purpose of irtikaf? To see your Muslim brothers, to be in the masjid, get good food. Um, to cleanse, uh, to cleanse your heart, to get bring you closer to Allah. To bring you closer to Allah, Allah, to focus on Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. In other words, when you're at home. When you're doing all these things, you may not have an absolute focus. And that's why in football, they have what? They have training camps. So, hey, in which they take you away from the city. No. They take you away from your house. It's a camp, two week camp. <coughs> we want you to spend the night here. Everybody goes to sleep at the same time, everybody wakes up at the same time. We control what you eat and drink. Because when you're at home, you may binge, you may eat this, you may drink this, you may do this. Or you may go too hard. We want you, we, we want to observe you in this camp. So they have a camp, they take you out of your, your locale. And this is the main concept when Jagat of going overseas to study. Why is it so important to go overseas to study? It's because you leave your friends and your family members. Mm -hmm. And friends and family members distract you from study. There's no doubt about that. They're gonna, they're gonna, they're gonna busy you. That's why you go away to go to college. But if you stay in Philadelphia, you could study and this and that, but people can reach you easily. And many people that want to talk to you, due to the sheer fact that you're distant from them, they have to get a phone call, they have to go an extra way, they say, I don't even feel like it. Mm. They're not even true friends, but it's reality. And you don't need those people bothering you. You know how many people, you know how many phone calls? Yeah, I mean, Saudi Arabia, we get a lot of phone calls, a lot of brothers call, emails, WhatsApp, whatever. But it's nothing compared to how many I get when I'm in Philadelphia. You got people calling from New York, from Philly, from Connecticut, from New Jersey, from Atlanta, from Minnesota, from Saudi Arabia. Brothers have been around me seeing this, right or wrong. No. We're in the class, it's on my calls. Some of those brothers are still contacting me with Medina, but a third or half of them won't. They're just not going to go through the trouble. And that's the wisdom of going away. Qurba. Being in a strange place aids you to focus. Being away from your comforts keeps you from being distracted. When you go to the store in Saudi Arabia, Depending on what store it is in Medina, the drinks, this is an example, the drinks are limited, limited drinks. Especially the corner store, they have this, they have that, I'm going to die, okay, I want this, I want juice, I want soda, water, this, water. But it's relatively limited. Well, why? when I come back to America, and you walk into the supermarket, Whole Foods, or Trader Joe's, or Pathmark, it takes you like two weeks to just like snap out of the days. Wow. The juice alone is from this end all the way to the next. 10, 15 brands of orange juice. Five, six, seven types of yogurt. Then this, that, Octavia, Kettle, Kettle. Cheese, eggs. <laughs> what? <laughs> huh? That's the noise that you hear. <laughs> this is no exaggeration. What's the point I'm trying to get to? Is that that's all good and hungry now, but that's, that's extra time. No, right. Shopping. No. I got three More types of cheeses. Yeah. This, that, that. Pick it and let's go. Mm -hmm. Get to America. Huge selection and variety of products. And that's just a supermarket. We can go to the halal place, the meat market, this, shoe store clothes. So much distractions. So this is from the wisdom of going away, cutting yourself off from these things. You can focus. And we can apply that concept to the cab. You go in your house, your wife, your children, your sons, this, 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 and that. And imagine, please don't call me, that's an emergency. You make sure the house is stocked, everything you need, kind of safe. Unless it's an emergency, please do not contact me. It's the wisdom of what? Of making it together. Everybody with me? No, no. Make sense? No, no, no. Okay, so moving on. The two authors, they say, nah, nah. What is the meaning, what is the meaning of the word etikaf? They say, The word etikaf means to stick to something. To stay put. To remain idle in one place for a considerable amount of time. So therefore in the Arabic language, stay in the place. Don't move. As Ibrahim said to his people, He says, what are these idols? Huh? What are these idols that you make it together with? In other words, what are these idols that you stay with all the time, and pray mm. to, and kneel to, and call to? Wow. You're attached and fastened to these idols. What's up? Mm. Except there's people. So that's the linguistical meaning of the term, yeah, to It's to stay put in one place, okay? 
So therefore, the one who stays in the masjid and is, is, performs ibadah, he's called mu'takif, and he's called akif. It's another dua that Ibrahim made. وَالرُّكَعِ sujood. He says, Allah says, وَالطَّاهِ بَيْتِيَ لِلطَّاهِفِينَ وَالْعَاكِفِينَ وَالرُّكَعِ sujood. Allah said to Ibrahim, his son Ismail, and طَاهِرَ بَيْتِي He said, clean my house, purify the Kaaba and the Masjid Haram from spiritual and physical filth. The spiritual filth were the idols and the images and people making tawaf being naked. Uh -huh. And there's any other physical filth that may have been in that place. So Allah told him and his son to clean my house for those who want to make tawaf, who want to make some tabulation around the Kaaba, those who make it a kuf, who stay reading, praying, worshiping him, who are ruka as sujood, and those who bow down, and those who prostrate themselves. So this is the linguistical meaning of the word iatikaf. It comes from three letters, which I had ayn, kaf, fa, a kaf. That's the linguistic breakdown of the word etikaf. Now, as for its meaning in Islam, it's not mentioned here in the book, then it is for a person to remain in the masjid to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's, that's what etikaf means. To stay in the masjid, to post up in the masjid for the purpose of cutting off the dunya and worshiping Allah Azza wa Jalla. Now, the authors, they didn't say, Mashru'iyya to who? Is etikaf from the sunnah? Is it legislated? Is, yani, is it something from the deen to make it to God? يُسْتَحَرُ فِي رَمَضَانَ وَغَيْرِهِ مِنْ أَيَامِ السَّنَةِ فَخَثَّبَتَ أَنَّ النَّبِي صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمَ اعْتَقَفَ آخِرَ الْعَشْرِ مِنْ شَوَّاءِ وَعَنَّ عُمَرَ قَالَ لِلنَّبِي صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمَ يَا رَسُولَ اللَّهِ إِنِّي كُنْتُ نَظَرْتْ فِي الْجَاهِلِيَّةِ عَنْ أَعْتَقِفَ لَيْلَةً فِي الْمَسْجِدِ الْحَرَامِ قَالَ فَأَوْفِ بِنَادِرِكَ فَأَعْتَقِفَ لَيْلَةً وَأَفْضَلُهُ فِي رَمَضَانَ أَنِّي حَدِيثَ بِهِ هُرَيْلَةً رَضِيَ اللَّهُ عَنْهُ أَنَّهُ أو كان رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم يعتكف في كل رمضان عشرة أيام فلما كان العام الذي قبض فيه اعتكف عشرين يوما. The authors say it is recommended to make the itikaf in and outside of Ramadan. Recommended to make the itikaf in and outside of Ramadan. It has been authentically reported that the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم once made itikaf during the last ten nights of Shawwal. During the last ten nights of Shawwal. It is also reported that Umar who once said to the Prophet O oh, Messenger of Allah, before I accepted Islam, I made a vow to Allah. And this hadith shows us is that the mushrikeen, the idolaters of Mecca before the time of Islam, before Islam came, they knew Allah and they worshipped Allah. But their problem was they didn't single him out in worship. Yeah. They took partners, middlemen, in between, intermediaries between them and Allah subhanahu wa but they knew Allah was and they worshipped him, they loved Allah they prayed to him abundantly but they did not have ikhlas they did not have tawheed so this hadith clearly shows us what tawheed means and it doesn't just mean tawheed of rububiyya tawheed of Allah's lordship because we know that tawheed of Allah's lordship is tawheed of Allah it's the single out of Allah in Allah's actions Hmm. The things that Allah does, Allah creates, Allah gives life, Allah takes that life, He sends down rain, He causes the govern the, the universe to run sufficiently, Probably. the sun rises, it sets, so on and so forth. We sing on our Allah in His actions. We believe the Allah is the only one who does those things. And then we have Tawheed al The Tawheed to sing on our Allah in your own actions. Your prayer, your fasting, your fear, your devotion, your trust in the lines is for Allah and Allah only. The problem that the mushrikeen had was with Tawheed al They knew Allah. They knew He was the only Lord, the only Creator, but they did not single Him out. And that's why the Prophet fought them and deemed their property, their blood, to be lawful. Okay? So therefore, it's incorrect for the Muslims to say, Tawheed, oh, everybody knows, everybody believes in Tawheed. La, la, la. He then says, of the authors, they say that Umar al said, before I had accepted Islam, I made a vow, I made a nether. He put something that wasn't obligatory upon himself. He made, that should we call what? Nether. Noon dal ra. Nether. A nether is an act of worship. In which you make something that's not obligatory, obligatory upon yourself. You say in your prayers, you do, oh Allah, I promise that I will fast three days for you. It's not obligatory fasting, but you make it obligatory upon yourself as a means of getting closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
okay? As a means of growing and increasing. I want to do more, okay? It's called another. And there's two types of another in the Quran, two types. We have another mutlaq and another muqayyid. We have an absolute vow and we have a restricted or conditional vow. The first is when you just do something extra for yourself and you make a promise to Allah. And the second is you ask Allah for something. Oh Allah, if you give me this job, I promise I will slaughter a sheep for your sake. Oh Allah, if you allow me to marry this sister, I will fast 10 days for your sake. Oh Allah, if you allow me to make this or get accepted this college, I will do this and I will do that. Everybody understand this? These are the two types of another. Another is an act of worship that has to only be done for Allah. You cannot make a vow to a saint, to a sheikh, or any man. I promise I'm going to do this, blah, 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 only for Allah. Wa so therefore, Umar said, if I was a Muslim, I made another. Okay? I made a vow to Allah that I would do what? He said that I would make it a tikaf one night in the Masjid al Haram in Mecca. Look at that. He was a mushrik. And he knew Allah. And he wanted to worship Allah. So the Prophet ﷺ said, Oh, Fibi Nadrik. He said, Fulfill your vow. Fa'atakif layla ten. He says, Make etikaf any other night. Any other night. It doesn't always necessarily have to be the same time or the same place. Everybody understand? The authors, they didn't say that the best time to make etikaf, this is according to the authors of the book, okay? The best time to make etikaf, he says, in Ramadan. And the proof of this is the hadith that's been narrated by Hurairah radiallahu anhu, that the Messenger of Allah says, Salam will make etikaf every Ramadan for 10 days. During his last year, the last year in which he lived, he made it to Kaf for 20 days. He stayed in the masjid for 20 days. The authors say the best time to make it to Kaf is only the last 10 nights of Ramadan. And they mentioned the hadith that the Prophet Ali Sallam, he sustained in the masjid for the last 10 nights all the way up until he passed away, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Point four, the authors say, shurutuhu la yushra'u illa fil masajidi li qawlihi ta'ala wa la tubashiruhunna wa antum aakifuna fil masajid wa laysit hadhi al-aya al-masajid wa laysit hadhi al-masajid ala al-itlaq faqad warada taqniduha fi sahih sunnati al-musharrafati وَذَلِكَ قَوْلُ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمَ نَعْتِكَ فَإِنَّ فِي الْمَسَاجِدِ الثَّلَاثَةَ وَالسُّنَّةُ فِي مَنْ عَتَكَ فَإِنَّ يَسُومَ كَمَا تَقَدَّمَ عَنْ عَشْتَ رَضِيَ اللَّهُ تَعَالَى عَنْهَا طيب the authors say the first are the conditions of itikaf what are the conditions for you to make itikaf number one he says or the authors the two they say you should not make itikaf except inside of the masjids no itikaf in your house, no itikaf in this place or your shop, or only itikaf in the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the proof for this is what Allah said in the Quran, Surah Al-Baqarah, وَلَا تُبَاشِرُهُنَّ Allah said, do not approach your wives, do not be intimate with your wives, and you're making itikaf in the masjid, in the masjids. They didn't say that this term, mujahid, this word, masjid, masjids, is not unconditional. They say that there's a hadith that states there's no itikaf, except in the three masjids. There's no air to calf except in the three masjids. We're not going to get into this issue right now because it's too nifty. Okay? According to the author, you can only make air to calf in these three masjids. Other ulama say, any masjid in which there's a congregational prayer, in which there's a Jum'ah service, you can make air to calf in. Moving on. He says the sunnah, or they say that the sunnah for those who make air to calf is that they should fast. As it's mentioned in the hadith of Aisha anha. In other words, they say that it's not the best thing to do to make it together if you're not fasting. What if you were traveling or you were sick and you weren't fasting? Should you make it together? Is it okay to make it together? The authors didn't specifically or explicitly mention it's haram, but they said the sunnah, that which is best, is those who make it together should be doing what? Fasting. 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 You moved on to match. Tayyip, next point, the authors of the book say, What is permissible for the one who's making itikaf to do? What are you allowed to do? 
You have to just stay still in a masjid like a statue. Don't move, don't flinch. The only thing you do is read the Quran and sleep. That's it. Are you allowed to sleep? What is a person allowed to do in the masjid? They say, يَجُوزُ الْخُرُوجُ لِحَاجَتِهِ وَنْ يُخْرِجَ رَسَلُ مِنَ الْمَسْجِدِ لِيُغْسَلَ وَيَصَرَّحَ خَالَتْ عَيْشَةُ رَضِيَ اللَّهُ عَنْهَا وَنْ كَانَ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمَ يُدْخِرُ عَلَيْهِ رَسَلُهُ وَهُوَ مُعْتَكِمٌ فِي الْمَسْجِدِ وَأَنَا فِي حُجْرَتِي فَأُرَجِلُهُ وَفِي رِوَاعِتِهِ فَأَغْسِلُهُ وَإِنَّ بَيْنِي وَبَيْنَهُ لَعَاقِبَةُ الْبَابِ وَأَنَا حَائِضٌ وَكَانَ لَا يَدْخُلُ الْبَيْتَ إِلَّا لِحَاجَةِ الْإِنسَانِ إِذَا كَانَ مُعْتَكِفًا It's permissible for the one who's making itikaf to leave the masjid for a need or a necessity. It's, it's okay if you leave the masjid if there's a need or a necessity. Whether that need is using the bathroom, something that's an emergency, something like this, it's permissible for you to walk outside of the masjid. But before we move on, we have to understand that the masjid during the time of the Prophet and the masjid during these times are very, very, very different, very contrast. The size of the masjid, the style of the masjid, the form of the masjid. Here today, alhamdulillah, we have air conditioning. All right? We have electricity. Okay? We have the bathrooms, the restrooms. All here. Many masjids have showers. They have a, you know, a shower inside of the bathroom. The brothers want to take showers. Or sisters want to take showers. A guest, whatever. Something happens, you just want to get clean, they have a shower. Back in the time, the Prophet says something. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Rather, even today, in some countries, some rural places, or quote unquote third world countries, or even not too long ago, in many uh, in Middle Eastern countries, or Far Eastern countries, or African countries, okay, or Muslims in South America, or wherever they were. You had to walk for a distance to use the bathroom. Okay? Any old, old, older brothers, huh? You go down south, you visit your parents, visit your grandparents or something, you have to go to our house. Any, we have any of those old brothers here? Is this not the case? Even in some places, not too long ago. You gotta take a little walk, take the candle or whatever with you and a stick, go to the bathroom. So this is how things were back in the day. The masjid was not attached. There was no bathroom, no restroom in the masjid, evident. There was no flushing, no plumbing, no modern means of technology. So therefore, these rulings are a bit different. If you got to use the restroom here, I'm that's not the house, right there. But back then, it's permissible for you to leave the masjid to use the restroom, to relieve yourself, okay? Um, or eat, okay? The masjids then were like the masjids now, even though their meals were simple and basic. And that's a whole other concept that we want to get into right now, say It's a whole topic in itself. The hadith about when the adhan is called, or when the aqam is made, and your supper is served, eat your supper first. There's a whole issue, a whole argument among the ulama. Is it permissible to continue to eat while the prayer is being established? Do you have to be starving, hungry, uh, something's going to happen to the food? And then Hafiz bin Hajar, or I believe he was quoting from Ibn al Jawzi, okay, in Fatah Badi, that the meals of the companions are not like the meals that we have today. It was simple, basic meals. <clears throat> the companions ate, ate meat. They had warm things. They had broth. They had bread. They had sauce. They had things like that during those times. But that 